Good morning. I know you are small in numbers, but you are mighty in character. So we can do this again and do it louder. Good morning. There is a mighty character here. The rest of you can join in. Good morning. Oh, forget it. We're done. We're going backwards. Good job. Okay. The rest of you, job. Okay. Do you recognize this? Yeah, 50, right? It's more than one dollar. You've got one. Do you want to trade? Because I was going to tear this up. So, I know. Should I not tear it up? Well, what if I tore up your dollar? Oh, because it's only a dollar. Can I tear yours up instead? No. Should we be, should we be tearing up money? What would happen if we did? What would happen if I just took this and started tearing it? It would be bad? They have to throw it away. I mean, I wouldn't have $100 because I'd have two fifties? Yeah, you'll get to math sometime. Anyway. Anyway. You know, we are taught to not tear up money. We're taught to take care of it because if you tear it up, like Declan said, you should throw it away. And no one's about throwing away money, especially $50, because you could buy a lot of things. And yet we sometimes get so protective of money that we forget that it's actually just given to us as a trust from God. You go, oh, no, 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 no. I have to earn money. Declan has an allowance. He, he earns money. He earns quarters for things that he does. Maybe some of you have allowances or not. You hear that? He makes my coffee, I pay him. <laughs> a quarter a cup. He is raking up the bucks. Okay, we are taught to take care of money and to hold it closely and to be careful with it. You love money? Yeah, money's a good thing. But you know what? God gives money for you to use it, not just for yourself, but to use it for others to use it to what we call expand the kingdom of God. Money isn't just about going out and buying Hot Wheels or Paw Patrol or Princess Sophia or clothes or makeup. I know, I got y'all excited, huh? It's about using it for the kingdom of God. Toys are fine, makeup is good, clothes are important, kingdom of God is more important. So as you think about how you use money, and Deacon Tony will help you with uh, some of this as, we, as you go to Children's Church if you do that, the idea is not to think money is yours, but to think that money is always God's, and how do you use it in a way to always thank God for what you have, whether it's a 50 or whether it is one dollar or more. We're going to talk to your moms and dads and parents and guardians and friends all about that. So let's fold our hands, repeat after me. Yeah, food is good too. Buy some food. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, help us use everything you give us to your glory. Amen. Okay, you can head out to Children's Church or back to your seats, wherever you have to go, go and do that. You would be surprised. If you were in first service this morning, I lost this 50 twice during the sermon. You think, how can you lose money when you're standing in front? Which is why Michelle hangs on to all my money. If I have more than five in my money clip, I panic. Which is why I use my ATM card to buy coffee at McDonald's for $1.09, and she gets the charge. She's like, really? I go, I don't, I don't carry cash. I have a card, and I know how to use it. What we're talking about today, $50, $100, $1,000, $1, the idea as we continue our stewardship emphasis, and if you're visiting, I kind of apologize, only half-heartedly though, because if you're visiting, you still need to hear this, because we're not asking for money, we're asking you to think about the gifts God has given you. And in the course of this stewardship emphasis, which is a part of the larger sermon series, Transformed by Jesus, we have been looking at how Jesus has transformed our idea of time and talent, and today how he transforms our ideas about money. And I think it's perfect 
that it fell on Reformation Sunday. So it's red up here, red here, because almost 500 years ago, in 1517, at the end of this week, Martin Luther, on October 31st, went to the Castle Church in Wittenberg and nailed up what has become known as the 95 Theses. They were 95 issues that he had with the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. And so he wanted to have a discussion about kind of, at a lower level, some ideas of stewardship. Not so much just how money is used, but the Catholic Church, in his perspective in 1517, was saying you had to earn your way into God's grace. You had to do things in order for God to like you. And so the question became, are you giving enough time? Are you giving enough of your talents and are you giving enough of your money? Because if you're not, God may not like you and you may not go to heaven. So if you think you're giving enough, you're probably not, so give more. And if you're giving more, you're probably not giving enough, so give more. Give, 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 because if you don't, God may not like you. And Luther, in reading scripture, said, I don't know if that's the message. So if you hear me saying that message, I'm not. At least I'm not trying to. Luther went and said, we need to talk about why we are Christians and what we have gained as Christians. And so the gospel for today says, when the son, Jesus, sets you free, you are free indeed. Well, the audience that he was talking to said, we've never been enslaved. I don't know how badly they did in school, but they must have failed little Jewish school because if they knew their history as Jewish people, they would know that they had been enslaved probably 10 times by the time Jesus comes along. You've got the slavery in Egypt. Did you forget about that, people? You have the slavery in Babylon that you just got out of just a few years ago. Did you forget that one, dear people? And you had all the times that the book of Judges talks about they were enslaved and imprisoned and captive by the Philistines and the Canaanites. Did, are you reading your history, people? And yet they say we have never been enslaved by anyone. They were too proud. They were far too convinced that they had earned their freedom to even look at their history and say, you know what, we are a history. We have a history as a people who get enslaved. And we may have the same thing. We may think we live in a free country. We can go where we want, do what we want, say what we want. Really? Because there's this thing called taxes. There are these things called laws. There are these things called boundaries. There's this thing, granted no one actually does this, but there are signs posted on the LIE for a speed limit. Limits. We have limits in our life. You think you're free? Great, until you pass a limit and someone's going to go, oh, guess what? Give me your hands because I have these nice jewelry pieces for you called handcuffs. And yet Jesus says to us, if you are set free by the Son, you are free indeed. And he's not talking about no more speed limits. He's not talking about getting rid of taxes. He's not talking about getting rid of the Roman Empire. That's what the Jews were hoping for. Jesus, come into my life and put me above all of this worldly thing so I can do what I want. And he would look at you and go, get real. You live in the world. And there are boundaries in the world, and what Jesus is talking about is saying, you are free from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Just like Austin is free now, we are free, not because of how much time we've given, because he hasn't done much yet, or talent, or treasure, but because of what Jesus has done, because of his sin, death, and his, his death and resurrection. Here's a question for you. What is it that you can give to Jesus today? And if you say, well, I can give him my time, I'll say don't. Well, I can give him my talents, just don't. I can give him money. You know what, you can't give him any of that. The only thing you can give Jesus today is your sin. That's all you carry around. You give that to Jesus, he forgives you, and now your time and your talent and your treasure, they're all his. They are gifts from him. They're given to you as gifts from him. You don't give this back to him. 
As if God needs your money to make heaven balance the spreadsheet? As if God isn't creative enough? He did all of the creation without you. He's got some talents and time. Well, since he's eternal, he's not worried about 5 o'clock or 8 o'clock or 12 o'clock. So he's not waiting for you to give him something. He's waiting to give it to you. Wow. And the only way he can do that is for you to come and give him your sin and say, I can't do this because I am enslaved to sin, which is exactly what Jesus was talking about. It's not the Babylonian history. It's not the Egyptian history. It's not any of that history. It's not where you're at right now to the Jews. It's not what you think you have right now that's enslaving you. You've been freed from sin. And when that comes into your life and you realize that, you realize all of a sudden, my time is completely a gift from God. We talked about that. My talents are completely a gift from God. And now, my treasure. That's even dicey. It's not your treasure. It's God's. He gives it to you. How do you manage? Stewardship isn't about it's mine. Stewardship is it's somebody else's. And how do I use it responsibly? How do I use it in a response to what God has done for me? Whether it's tearing up a $50 bill, whether it is hundreds of dollars, whether it's a dollar, it doesn't matter. It's God's. And the moment you think it's mine and I'm giving it back to God, you've turned it into a good work. And we might as well get Luther out of here and go back to 1517. Giving to God isn't a good work. It's not getting you anywhere. It doesn't get you more favor with God. It doesn't get you any more grace with God. It's already God's. You're just using it the way he intended it to be used, to strengthen believers and transform communities. What am I giving to God? Your sin. That's all you can give. So the question becomes, how do I use that which God has given me in a way that brings glory to God and takes emphasis off of me and what I need and what I want? My fears, my envy, my whatever drives how I use my time and my talent and my treasure. Is it getting me ahead? Does it help me get the toys I want? Does it help me get the job I want? Do I have enough time to show how great I am? It's not yours, it's God's. And how do I say, God, it's yours? How do I use it in the best way possible? And it's the same with your money. No, I go to work. I work hard for my money. It's mine. You can think that. And you can hold tightly to it. And you'll miss the point of being free. Because you'll be enslaved to money. Because you'll never work hard enough, have enough in your retirement. You will never have enough to satisfy that fear that you have to hang on to it. You'll win the lottery and be broke in a year because you won't know what to do with the gift that God puts into your life. It's not yours. And yet at the same time, God doesn't need it. Heaven's not going bankrupt. But you need to let go of it for your sake to be freed from that, that need to grab and to hold and to control. That's what this stewardship emphasis for the last three weeks has been. Let go of that, that time management and just say every moment is a gift from God and am I using that gift to bring glory to God? In public, in private, in every moment, am I bringing glory to God? Is my time that he has given me being used in the way he calls me to use it? Are my talents being used in the way he has called me to use them? And is my money being used in a way he has called me to use it? That's what stewardship is. It's not about saying, am I doing enough? Because as soon as you put the word enough on there, You've taken your life right back to what Luther would say was Roman captivity. We're free from that. Whether you give a moment of your day to Jesus, 
Whether you give any talent to Jesus, whether you give zero dollars to Jesus, Jesus has died for you and forgives you. It's not about paying him back. It's about realizing he has done everything freely for me. And how do I freely do everything I have for him? No strings attached. All of a sudden, that 50, it's not mine. This 50 is opportunity. It's opportunity for me to be maybe a good citizen and pay my taxes, 15.3 of my taxes on top of taxes because I'm self-employed. Maybe it's to pay my light bill because Declan likes to watch Paw Patrol. What? <laughs> Four-year-olds can listen in church. Maybe it's to buy food because we need to eat. Maybe being responsible means I need some new clothes. Or maybe not because I have 15 pairs of pants and that's probably enough. Or maybe it's saying I have opportunity to help strengthen a believer or transform a community because I don't need more than I have already. And how can I use this opportunity for somebody else? Maybe it's through the ministry of Grace Lutheran Church. Maybe it's through the tithes and offerings that come in here so we can be stewards of all that God has given us. It's opportunity to expand the kingdom of God. And how are you taking advantage of that opportunity? The ushers now have something, a handout. So if you wanted to get those out in the people's uh, hands, we can talk about that. Don't want to lose that. Okay. What you're being given is something to think about. And here's what I would say. If you are offended by this, I'm not going to say I'm sorry. I'm just going to say you're offended by this. Because here's the deal. If you are watching a Burger King or McDonald's commercial and you're feeling guilty because you're not eating enough vegetables, it's because you're not eating enough vegetables. It's not the commercial's fault. It's the fact that you know deep down that you should be eating more broccoli and less french fries. Now, if you're eating enough broccoli and spinach and that commercial comes on, it doesn't affect you because you know what? I'm good with my greens. The only time people are convicted is really when they know something isn't quite square in their life. When opportunity presents itself and you don't look at it as opportunity, it's because you are being convicted by something. This is opportunity. This is not forced. What you have in front of you is, it says, Grace Lutheran Church, July 14 to June 15, Congregational Giving Record. It simply records on a weekly basis what kind of dollar amounts do we bring in. We don't know from whom. I, I don't look at that. But we do know from this that 38 people per week, 35, I don't have my glasses on, 35 people per week give somewhere between a penny and $4.99. So less than $5.00. 38 people, 35 people per week do that. There are six people per week that give somewhere between 40 and 40 and $50. Whatever. It doesn't say anything about what I have to do. It simply hears where people are at. It's a fact. It's a fact that you probably need more broccoli than you're eating and more greens than you're eating. It's just a fact. And if you're guilty about that, you know you need it. Now on the back side of that is to help you figure out what would be a tithe, which is 10%? Or well, what would be what I can do? What can I do in order to say my money is opportunity? And how do I use the opportunity that God brings into my life through, through a pension, through Social Security, through hard work, through whatever means, just legal means, please. What opportunity do I have? And how do I respond to that by saying, God, I am going to put this into your service. I'm putting this opportunity in service to you. Next week, we have a guest pastor. I'm still here, but to finish up the stewardship series, there's a guest pastor coming in to bring this home. He will talk about this a bit more. We wanted to get it into your hands for you to pray about and say, God, where am I availing myself or using opportunity? And how might I be squandering opportunity and how do I respond to the fact that I have been set free by the Son 
So my time and my talent and my treasure are all from you. And how am I using it? Because you see, if Grace Lutheran Church wants to make a difference in this community, the reality is we need resources. It's just real. And what I don't want to ever have happen is for Grace Lutheran Church to leave this location and people to go, what was that building? And never miss us. That is the squandering of time and talent and treasure. If Grace Lutheran Church were to stop existing today, would this area miss us? I can bet there are 180 families who would say, man, next summer, when they're not going to movie night, they would say, man, I miss those movies. There are going to be maybe 177 kids who were in discovery camp going, their parents would be going, where was that free place to take them in the beginning of summer? I want them out of my house for a half a day. Whatever it takes, I want to be missed. I want this place to become so important to this community that if we stopped existing, the community would have an outcry of saying, you can't leave us. We need you, which is we need Jesus. Our time and our talent and our treasure are gifts in order for us to be needed. It's opportunities to be available in this community. That chart may help you figure out, am I taking the most of the opportunities that I have been given? Or can I be challenged a bit more? Can I see things differently? And it's not just about money. If we began to have a million dollars coming in every week starting next Sunday, I wouldn't say no. But I would also say there's not enough people around to use it. So now we have a big bank account, but I still need 15 people a week to do movie nights. I still need 47 people to do discovery camp. I still need five people every Sunday to teach Sunday school. I still, money isn't going to do it all. So it is time and talent and treasure as one package together. Opportunity to strengthen believers and transform communities because the Son has set us free and we are free to serve indeed. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may that peace keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. We continue now with the opportunity to bring our tithes and offerings forward.